So today we're going to be talking about uh, coronavirus again. We want to welcome back Dr. Merrick. Um, we're going to be talking specifically today about the coronavirus vaccine um, and any questions you might have about it. And again, um, Dr. Merrick's been working on this directly, so is very up to date with the latest sort of medical and scientific information. Um, Dr. Merrick is uh, the medical director of the Center for Special Studies uh, in the Adult HIV Clinic at New York Presbyterian Weill Cornell Medical Center. I think it's great that everyone's, um, you know, really good becoming the uh, community experts on this. It's so important to, um, you know, have the right information and, uh, you know, get everyone uh, really educated about the, the, you know, the risks and benefits of, um, of vaccines. Um, so in general, just broadly speaking, um, in terms of vaccines, there's lots and lots of different kinds. Um, some of them are what we call live attenuated. And that means you actually take a piece of the virus or really the whole virus and they change it so that it can't cause severe disease, but it still actually can cause mild infection. And that's really how the vaccine works. And some examples of those that are those live attenuated are um, measles, mumps, rubella, um, the old smallpox vaccine, um, and uh, smallpox was eradicated in 1979, I think. So we don't obviously use that anymore. Although uh, I was traveling in 1978 and, and actually had to get a smallpox vaccine. So I was one of the last, last people to, to get one. Um, chicken pox, yellow fever, rotavirus. And the important thing about live attenuated vaccines is that in folks who are immunocompromised or in people with HIV who have very low T cells, they can be a little bit riskier because you're actually kind of giving someone, you know, a, a very light case of the disease. Um, so typically in HIV, we want the T cells over 200 and they'd be something you'd be concerned about and someone on chemotherapy and so forth. Um, there's inactivated vac uh, vaccines where they take the virus and they literally just inactivate it. It looks like the virus, but it's not even going to cause mild disease. Um, the flu shots are inactivated vaccines, polio shot. Um, there's live versions of the flu and the polio, uh, hepatitis A, rabies. Then there's these sort of subunit or polysaccharide or conjugate or recombinant. You don't need to know all those terms, but basically those are things that we make in the lab. Um, and they might be small pieces of the vaccine in an important area, uh, sorry, of the, of the virus in an important area. Um, that will stimulate the appropriate immune response. The human papillomavirus is um, in this category. Pneumonia vaccines are polysaccharide and conjugate um, hepatitis B. And the newest shingles vaccine is, is fully recombinant, so just made in a lab. Um, and then there's actually toxoid vaccines, um, which instead of giving you the actual uh, bacteria or virus, they give you the toxin that's produced by that virus and you get an immune response to that. Tetanus and diphtheria are two examples of that. And now more recently, these nucleic acid vaccines. Um, and that's the category of the COVID vaccine. And there's both DNA and RNA vaccines. Um, why should we get vaccinated? And it's just interesting to see, um, you know, vaccines save lives. They save a lot of lives. Um, if you look at the average um, morbidity, which is you know serious illness in the 20th century, so last century from these various diseases, these see things like measles. You know, 530,000 people a year um, got sick and many died of measles, and you see this huge drop off. Obviously, smallpox I mentioned is no longer seen in the world, um, but even things like uh, uh, pertussis, which is you know very severe for kids and and um, you know, also, you know, pretty bad for, for adults. Um, that's the Tdap vaccine that we get boosters of every 10 years. Mumps, all these things really caused a lot of very, very serious illness and kids died. And, um, you know, one of the concerns we have um, about the sort of vac vaccine skepticism um, is number one, for two or three generations, we haven't really seen complications from things like measles. And so people don't think it's that big of a deal. So, so that's the rationale for vaccines. Um, you know, it really, uh, 
make sense. These are all the vaccines that they're looking at for, um, for coronavirus. So there's a lot. There's 12 DNA vaccines. There's these protein-based vaccines. Um, there's uh, live attenuated. Remember I mentioned that. There's inactivated candidates, eight of those. There's 20 of the RNA vaccines. So there's a lot of different vaccine candidates um, you know, that are being tested. And um, some of them, you know, we may have another, uh, another vaccine candidate in the next month or so that uh, would be one shot and doesn't have to be kept in a freezer. We don't know how good it is yet, and we'll have some more data probably by the end of January. It's made by Johnson & Johnson and Janssen. So a lot of J's there. Um, this isn't the whole um, schema of, of how the mRNA vaccines work, but it gives you a good sense of the most important step and, mm -hmm. and gives you an idea of really what's happening here. You know, They literally are taking a little stretch of mRNA that they've made in a lab. And mRNA is very important in our bodies. Um, it's, it's messenger RNA. And that's what the, the cells use as instructions to make proteins. And proteins are enzymes that do all kinds of things in our body and other things. And the key to it, and, and this is important to know, is that these vaccines have been worked on really for more than a decade. So it's not brand new. It's not something that someone cooked up in the lab just last year. Um, They've been working hard on this for quite some time. And there have actually been clinical trials of other mRNA vaccines for things like Zika virus. Uh, and uh, I think even uh, the MERS virus, which is another coronavirus. And part of the reason we never really got an mRNA vaccine is those epidemics kind of died out on their own. And um, so there wasn't really a demand for them and it was more difficult to do the clinical trials to, to test them. But people have been in clinical trials um, from these, you know, dating back many, many years. And at least in those trials, they have not seen any longer term complications. So that's very reassuring. But what happens, the key to, um, you know, becoming successful in terms of using these mRNA vaccines was they had to figure out how to package them to get them to our cells. Because if you stick a little length of any kind of protein um, you know, into our body, either with an intramuscular injection or IV, the body just degrades it very, very quickly. So it wouldn't even make it to its target. So these are little bubbles of fat and they're tiny. They're nanoparticles, which is 10 to the minus ninth you know, centimeters or something crazy small like a less than the length of a, uh, the width of a hair. So these particles come in, they insert that little piece of mRNA and our cells go, oh, here's some mRNA. And that mRNA codes for the spike protein, which is the really important part of the coronavirus. And what most of the vaccines are targeting that spike protein, because it seems that when you um, get a response to that spike protein, it gives you protective antibodies. So it makes these spikes and then it sticks them onto our cells. Our body recognizes this as something foreign and makes the T cell and B cell response antibodies and, and killer T cells. And then these cells eventually die and just get cleaned up. Um, so the mRNA just doesn't last that long, but it lasts long enough to create um, this immune response. So it does not get inserted into our own DNA and, and it, it really is a very, very transient thing. And within, you know, a day or so it's all gone. Um, so both of the vaccines, the Pfizer and the Moderna, those are the two, they're both mRNA vaccines. Um, and part of the reason, you know, one of the reasons people are nervous about it is because it was so fast. You know, everybody's read the stories. Um, in the past, you know, it was three or four years for, for most vaccines at best. Um, but number one, obviously, we've never had a public health emergency um, like this in the last 100 years. Um, so a lot of uh, personnel and money was thrown at it. One of the things you can do when you throw money at it is you can sort of take the risk away for these companies. And um, they can do these very large trials very quickly. 
How can you do a trial quickly? Well, when there's a lot of disease around, you can find a difference very quickly. If, if you're dealing with a disease that's kind of unusual, like even hepatitis B, you might have to do a trial for 10 years to get enough cases of hepatitis B to prove that your vaccine is working. But will you have um, sites in the country where, you know, 10, 20, 30 percent of the population is testing positive for COVID, you can get answers very, very quickly. So that's one of the reasons these trials were able to get answers quickly. You know, if we were at a 1 percent or a 2 percent rate of COVID, it might take two, three, four years to, to really do a trial that would give us answers. So that's one of the reasons. It's a bad reason, but it helped to get these trials done more quickly. They did tens of thousands of adults, okay, and I'll show you how many. 30% um, of the United States participants were um, folks of color. Um, they enrolled lots and lots of folks who had the conditions um, that made people at higher risk, like obesity, diabetes, or, or lung disease. Um, they didn't find any significant safety concerns. They collected data at least eight weeks and now longer after the trials ended. Um, they can cause a little fever, sometimes some headaches, some muscle aches, um, and that's actually a good sign because that means that your body is making that response. And some people have said the second dose is a little more intense. It varies. You know, I've had colleagues who've gotten the second dose already, and they're like, "Nah, eh, wasn't that bad." So, um, so the fact that you're getting that reaction and that you get that reaction with any vaccine is really just your immune system kicking in and fighting, you know, developing a response. Um, they don't interact with our DNA anyway, and you can't get COVID from it because it's not one of these live attenuated, it's mRNA. Um, quick touching base on, on what herd immunity is. Um, herd immunity is basically kind of the level of the population that needs to be immune to a given illness to stop it from being epidemic. And usually what that means is that we get epidemics when one person is infecting more than one other people, okay? And with COVID, that number is really two to three. So one person infects two to three um, and on and on. When we get that number under one, and that number is called R0 or R0, if one person is on average infecting fewer than one person, then the, 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 the epidemic gets under control. And that's for any disease. Um, that's epidemic. And that's been the goal of the end the epidemic in New York in terms of HIV is to, um, you know, get that number down in terms of new infections. Um, now, you can reach herd immunity naturally. And Sweden was one country that thought they were going to be able to do that. But the problem is, um, if you do that and just let it run wild, it's really an unacceptable number of deaths. Um, and, it, and it's just not something that any responsible government should be willing to do. And Sweden has backtracked and said, maybe that wasn't such a great idea. That might make sense with a very mild disease where most people recovered, um, but not where something where the death rate is, is what it is with COVID. Um, so, unfortunately, though, by wearing masks and being careful and, you know, uh, keeping people from getting infected, that decreases the, the likelihood we'll get natural herd immunity. And that's why vaccine uh, vaccines are so important because it's really vaccinating is the only way we're going to get this under control uh, more quickly. Um, so you can see just graphically, um, you know, this is that R not, and this is a hypothetical disease where you infect four people. One person on average infects four people. And measles can be some, is one of the most highly infectious. The R not is like 16, 17, 18 um, for, for people that are susceptible, which is not many, uh, thankfully. But, you know, you infect four people, and then though each of those people infects four, and before you know it, you have 16. That's a huge jump one to 16 in just two cycles of the virus. And that can happen over a period of months. And if you have enough of these starting, that's what we saw in March and April, that huge spread. Um, but if you have people who are vaccinated or maybe have already had the disease, that same one person can only infect one 
that one person might infect one more and so forth and so on, and you only end up with three. Um, this is how it looks with COVID, um, with vaccination, where the, that r not number is sort of two and a half to three and a half, I mentioned. Um, and, you know, it's going to depend on how good the vaccine is, but fortunately, the vaccines we have right now are super good. They're 95%, um, which is pretty amazing. Uh, we were hoping for over 50%, and 95% is quite amazing. We think that about 60 to 70% of the population needs to be either vaccinated or immune from natural disease before we can get this really under control. Um, what are some of the questions that we haven't answered about the vaccine? Um, in these trials, uh, what they really were looking at was, um, does it prevent symptomatic illness? Okay. Um, you know, how many people got sick? And so the way the trials were set up is they would test people, um, you know, within uh, a couple of weeks, at, not everyone, but within a couple of weeks after they finished their vaccine series. And they determined, um, you know, uh, in people who had symptoms, uh, who actually had the disease and who didn't. Um, so we don't really know yet, although there's more data coming in, whether it can prevent asymptomatic illness. So in other words, we don't want a situation where we vaccinated everyone and you can still get it, you just don't have any symptoms and you can continue to spread it to other people. It's pretty unlikely that that's going to be a big problem, um, but perhaps not impossible. Remember, 95% is still 95%. That means that we will see some cases even in people who are vaccinated. Hopefully they won't be as sick. We really don't have any idea how long the immunity will last. Will it be a flu shot kind of thing where every year um, is it something like, uh, you know, measles, which is basically good for life? Um, we really don't know. Um, that's also complicated by the fact that we know that there's these new strains, so they might have to tweak it from year to year and get boosters. So that's something we'll have to keep an eye on. In terms of long-term safety data, most complications from vaccines, you see it pretty much right away. Um, you know, back in 1978 with the swine flu uh, concern, um, they rolled out this swine flu vaccine very, very quickly. And there were some instances of something called Guillain-Barre, which is something that can happen with other vaccines and in other conditions. And it's kind of a neurologic thing and usually gets better, but you know, it was kind of alarming, but that was seen right away. Um, and so they were able to react to that. And so that's typically with vaccines. You don't really usually see anything, you know, five years from now. So we're not that concerned, but we'll have to wait and see. Um, I think it's the Pfizer vaccine included kids over 16. The Moderna was only 18. Um, so we really, you know, they're doing the trials in kids now. Um, and they excluded pregnant women. Um, but we do think it's safe for pregnant women. Um, there were uh, only a couple hundred participants who developed symptoms. Um, so they couldn't really break it down to say, well, it looked better in this population or worse in that population. Um, but we do know that it was effective. And then, um, you know, once you start vaccinating, is that going to push more towards these other strains? So far, it looks like these vaccines cover those strains. So that's not a big concern as of yet. Um, person who had COVID, when will it be safe to get the COVID vaccine? Um, so everyone should get it, even if you had COVID. That's an important point. Um, we think that the uh, vaccine uh, protection is better than the protection and will be longer lasting than the protection you get from having the disease. Um, and basically, you should just wait until you don't have symptoms or as long as your quarantine lasts. So, you know, if you have COVID uh, and, and you're, you know, quarantine for 10 to 14 days and you don't have any symptoms any longer, it's fine to go ahead and get the vaccine. We know that the immunity from natural infections lasts probably at least 90 days and, and potentially longer. So if you did just recently have COVID, you've got some protection for a while, so you don't have to rush to get it. Um, and it's probably okay to wait. Um, reinfections are incredibly rare. Um, 
it may be that if you um, have some antibody to COVID already from having had the infection, that when you get the vaccine, your arm's gonna be a little bit more sore than someone who hadn't had COVID. Um, and you might have some more fever and aches, um, but that's kind of a developing story to see, you know, see, but nothing, nothing that much more serious. Um, and then this is kind of a question about allergies, such as, you know, food allergies, dust allergies, um, you know, other medication allergies, um, and whether or not you should take anything beforehand. And the answer to this is, um, it really doesn't seem that, um, you know, people with regular kinds of allergies, like, you know, you get allergies in the spring with the pollen, or you can't eat shellfish, or, you know, any of those common allergies that lots and lots of people have, it does not seem that there have been serious reactions in those groups. So there's really no reason not to get the vaccine. And they don't really recommend taking anything in advance. In part, um, we don't want to do anything that will decrease the ability of the body to respond to the vaccine, right? So we don't want to dampen that immune response. Um, so whether that would be a big effect if you took some Motrin and some Benadryl, probably not. It's certainly okay to take Motrin and Benadryl after you get the vaccine if you feel like you need to, um, but they don't recommend taking anything in advance. Um, and uh, anyone who gets the vaccine uh, will wait around for 15 minutes after you've gotten the vaccine. Um, and if you've had a serious reaction to anything in the past, okay, it doesn't mean you can't get the vaccine, but they'll probably have you wait 30 minutes. So, you know, if you have a, a serious, you know, bee sting allergy and you have to carry an epinephrine pen around with you um, and you've had a serious reaction, they might tell you to wait for 30 minutes. But again, that doesn't mean you can't get the vaccine safely. Is what if the person gets an allergic reaction from a COVID vaccine, can they try any other COVID vaccine or will you be allergic to all of them? That's a great question. We don't know yet. Um, why people have these um, serious allergic reactions. So that's an important question, right? The, the sort of biggest, you know, leading theory right now is that there's something called polyethylene glycol in both of these vaccines um, and in the Johnson & Johnson vaccine that's coming. Um, it's also polyethylene glycol is the ingredient that's in Miralax, which people use, you know, for constipation to keep regular. So it's something that's out there in the environment. Um, they think it might be from that. Polysorbate, which is something that apparently is in lots of um, packaged and processed foods, looks a lot like polyethylene glycol. And so maybe people with a reaction to that might have a cross reaction, but this is preliminary. We really don't know for sure. Thankfully, there just haven't been that many. There have been a bit more than we see, say, with the flu shot, but um, we're talking about one in 100,000. No one has died. You know, um, people in the severe cases of which there have been, you know, a couple dozen, they've gotten epinephrine and, and done fine. Um, so the recommendation right now is if you have a severe reaction like anaphylaxis kind of a reaction where you get hives or difficulty breathing um, that you do not get the second vaccine and we're going to have to wait and see um, about the others because as i said the two that are closest on the horizon also the astrazeneca um, have polysorbate but not peg so we're going to have to sort that out um, so we'll see. The good news is, is that um, even just with one vaccine, you probably have a pretty good degree of protection. I think there definitely absolutely will be vaccines that don't have these ingredients and that will be more traditional um, vaccines. You saw how many uh, vaccines they're looking at, but, but this will be something that we'll keep a close eye on. Fortunately, most people are not going to have that reaction. Um, so what is the guarantee that the vaccine is going to help or prevent COVID? Great question. Um, these are, is a quick summary of the, of the studies. The Pfizer is three weeks apart, two shots for over 16. The Moderna is, is four weeks apart, over 18. 
um, large numbers of people, 36,000 and 30,000 in, in both of those trials. And as I said, 95% protection uh, roughly in both. They had a number of infections in, in both trials. Um, but as you can see, for instance, in, in Pfizer, there were 162 in the group that didn't get vaccine, they got placebo and only eight in the vaccine group. So that's pretty huge. I mean, that's a home run in terms of vaccines. Um, so, so that's about as close to a guarantee as we can get, not 100%, but uh, looking back at that herd immunity discussion, um, you can understand how that's gonna, gonna really help us get there quickly. Um, someone said, can I get a vaccine if I'm allergic to sunlight? Absolutely. Um, the only strict prohibition uh, for not getting the vaccine is if you know, which most people wouldn't, that you're allergic to something that's in the ingredients of the vaccine. Um, but if you have general allergies, it's definitely okay. And just a quick note on penicillin, um, Lots and lots of us were told by our mom or dad or whoever that when you know when you're a kid you had a reaction to penicillin. So we all walk around for our entire life saying I'm allergic to penicillin. Probably only about one of a hundred of those are actually allergic to penicillin. When you're a kid, you can get rashes from all kinds of viral illnesses, and there's even one common viral illness kids get where if you give someone penicillin, they get a rash. Um, so, but that's not a true allergy to penicillin. So this is a plug. Um, if you can, it's not that easy, but allergists can test you for penicillin allergies. My daughter, you know, was told she had penicillin allergies. She got tested. She's not allergic. So it's a good thing to know. Um, we have a lot of other antibiotics, but so not only um, is it okay, even if you really truly do have an allergic, an allergy to penicillin, it's okay to get the vaccine. The chances are you probably aren't allergic. Um, so, and the immunity to rubella shouldn't make any difference at all. Um, and in terms of drinking alcohol, um, for sure, I encourage you, you know, to get the vaccine, whether you're a moderate drinker or a heavy drinker, if you're a heavy drinker, you know, try to cut back a little bit, just that's general good advice. Um, but alcohol should not have any interaction and definitely encourage you regardless any kind of substance use. You know, if folks are actively using other substances, it's totally fine to go ahead and get the vaccine. Definitely encourage it just as a general health thing. Um, and can I get a vaccine if I have high blood pressure? Absolutely, yes. Um, in fact, you're in a group that really um, should get it um, because you're at slightly higher risk if you do get COVID of having more serious disease. Um, so, you know, just make sure you're taking your blood pressure medication and that your blood pressure is in good control, but no one's gonna check your blood pressure before you get the vaccine. And even if it's running a little bit high, there shouldn't be any added complications, okay? So, um, so definitely go ahead and get it, even if you have high blood pressure, and especially if you have high blood pressure. Another similar question with heart disease, or if your heart's not healthy, again, that's a higher risk category um, if you get COVID. So absolutely, we want you to do that. No impact of the vaccine, you know, one way or the other in terms of affecting your heart disease. Um, so absolutely encourage you um, to, to get that uh, if you have heart disease. So in terms of antivirals, um, and I, you know, in terms of uh, does the vaccine interact with antiviral? Do HIV antiviral medications protect you from COVID? And the answer is probably not. Um, although they're still looking at that, um, but there's no interaction with the vaccine. So shouldn't have any impact. Keep taking the antivirals and absolutely get the vaccine. Um, one thing um, I wanted to mention, and this would be unusual since we're not using them very much, is there's monoclonal antibodies that are used to treat COVID. Um, we don't use them very often because they're for people who aren't that sick, who are not in the hospital, and it's complicated and challenging to arrange because it's an intravenous infusion. But if you did get those monoclonal antibodies, you need to wait 90 days because that can interfere with the vaccine. If I'm pregnant or planning to get pregnant or breastfeeding, um, pregnancy, you know, we did see a little bit of a risk of uh, more severe disease. Um, 
although not mortality, um, but you know, people ending up needing closer monitoring and, and being in the ICU. Um, and although the trials did not include pregnant people, it's thought to be safe um, for folks who are pregnant or planning to be pregnant. And really the risk of, of illness while you're pregnant, if you got COVID is, is probably much, much higher than the risk of the vaccine. So most experts are recommending it, but it's the kind of thing that you really want to have a, a conversation with your doc, weigh it, you know, the risks and benefits in your particular situation, and uh, talk about whether you could get it or not. In terms of breastfeeding, it definitely should be safe. We don't think the vaccine crosses over in the breast milk, so no issues there. Um, if I've had COVID, should I get the vaccine? Absolutely, because um, it's probably better than natural infection. If I get the vaccine, do I still need to wear a mask and practice social distancing? Unfortunately, yes. Um, we still don't have the answer to whether we're preventing just symptomatic disease and asymptomatic disease. So we want everyone to continue to be careful. Um, you know, you may psychologically feel a little bit more protected, and that's great. But keep wearing those masks, and uh, yeah, we're going to have a lot more information three months from now even after a lot of folks have been vaccinated and we see how well the protection is in real life. Um, how long is the protection for? We don't know, but we'll we'll have a better idea over the next six to 12 months. These are the uh, state and city uh, sites um, for finding a vaccine. Um, do you actually have any sort of COVID symptoms from the shot itself? You said it's not actually the virus itself. Um, what are, what should someone expect? Um, in terms of symptoms from the vaccine? Yeah, so probably close to 100% of folks sore arm, okay? But you've had that with lots of other vaccines, right? Um, probably for a day or a little bit longer. Um, in a small, you know, group of people, you know, maybe a quarter of people or so, maybe a little low-grade fever, even for a day or two. By low-grade, I mean around 100, maybe a little bit higher. Um, and maybe some fluish symptoms, specifically um, kind of all over muscle aches and fatigue, okay? Those would be the primary things, fever, muscle aches, sore arm, fatigue. Um, and they can last for a day or two, um, typically not um, in most folks. Um, and again, once you get the vaccine, go ahead and use some Tylenol or Motrin if that's safe um, for you. Um, and, uh, you know, you might even have a little redness. Um, there's one, funky thing that we saw in a lot of, um, actually my colleagues kind of noticed this, I think it was just with the Moderna, but or maybe the Pfizer, I can't remember one of them, um, where it was a little bit weird um, is the Moderna that they were fine after a day and then one week later, they got this little rash, you know, that was two or three centimeters, a couple inches around on their arm that lasted for a day or two right in the area where they got the shot and then went away. Don't really know what it means, but literally six or seven folks just here within a small group of, of providers noticed that. Didn't have any other symptoms, but don't quite know what that is. But uh, so that's really what to expect. And just to clarify too, none of that is because you're receiving anything that is like the virus itself. This is just because of um, this is just the kind of thing that you get with vaccines sometimes. You're not getting any sort of form of the COVID vaccine. No. I mean, the COVID virus in the vaccine itself. Absolutely not. Yeah. Um, you cannot, absolutely cannot get COVID from this. Yeah. And it's not one of those live attenuated. It's just that one tiny little strip that can make the spike protein. And the spike protein itself is not enough to cause disease. Um, and really, with any vaccine, Again, that sort of fever, aches, that's a good sign. It means that your body is responding to something foreign and developing a response to it. So it really means that it's working. If you don't get it, it doesn't mean that it's not working. It's just, you know, it's a natural thing that we expect. And everybody's sort of body in response to that is going to be a little different. But, you know, what you're saying is like, you know, if you get those sorts of symptoms, it's it's your body fighting, you know, building up sort of the immunity that you're supposed to build up. Exactly. exactly. Got it. But how long do you wait between 
vaccines and how long can you wait for the second vaccination? So I think that question is sort of like, um, what's the sort of outer limit of how long you can wait from one vaccine to the other? So right now the recommended schedule is three weeks for the Pfizer and four weeks for the Moderna between mm -hmm. shots. Um, you know, unfortunately we're in a situation where that's what the trials were. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so we don't have any data, although we will start to have some more information about that in countries, for instance, the UK, where they're trying to use up all the vaccine right away okay. and maybe potentially wait to give the second shot. Now, in most with most vaccines that require a booster to give you that extra added protection, um, usually it works just fine, even if you wait two, three, four months, okay? The likelihood is that getting the second shot a little late or even a lot late isn't going to matter. Now, you have a pretty good amount of protection after one shot. I would say if you're within a week of the of the recommended, you're totally fine. You're, you're probably going to be fine even if it was a month, but I can't tell you that for sure. So um, it's really just... Um, you start to get that response and then you get exposed to the same thing again a while later to really just get you an even stronger response and more protection. So, so it's probably going to turn out that waiting a bit is okay, but we just can't tell you for sure. Um, so so it's, try to get that second one as close as possible to the recommended interval. But it's one of those things like if you, if you, you know, had gone four weeks in, or five weeks instead of four weeks, you shouldn't be like, oh, I should just shouldn't get the second shot. You no, know? Like, yeah. Go and get it. Yeah. Go get it. Even if yeah. it's somehow, if it turns out yeah. to be six weeks or eight weeks, still do it. Get it. If they'll yeah. give it to you, go get it because probably it's going to turn out that it's just as good. Yeah. Okay. That's good to know. Have you heard about any um, side effects of Bell's palsy with the vaccination? Yeah, great question. There have been a couple of cases of that. And again, that's something that you can see um, with any uh, vaccine. Um, it's a benign condition, meaning, you know, it's not a stroke, it's not anything serious. And usually, thankfully, um, it does resolve, but it's pretty distra distressing when it happens. And, you know, the interesting thing about Bell's palsy is we don't, again, it's one of those things where we don't know the exact cause. Sometimes it's associated with a herpes virus infection, but it's probably got some immune component to it where you get, you know, you have trouble closing your eye and you have a little droop on one side of your face. It's scary because people feel like it's a stroke, but it's just limited to the face and, and typically uh, over a period of days to a few weeks that you go back to normal. So again, that's one of those rare side effects um, that frankly, you know, lots of vaccines have these rare side effects and we just don't hear about them or talk about them just because um, they are so rare. So I wouldn't be concerned about that. It's been been not, not seen much at all. And two, another reason I think, you know, like you said, that we, we don't end up talking about that sometimes is because the risk of that is so much lower than the risks associated with getting the virus itself. Exactly. Um, like exactly. so, so much lower. Um, yeah. So yeah. just emphasize that what is in the vaccine like it's a you said it's like um it's the mrna that's sort of surrounded by a fat cell right um yeah, it's a fat layer it's like yeah. a you know minuscule and by fat i mean it's kind of a lipid coat mm -hmm. you know um and then these things like the polyethylene glycol stabilize that lipid so that it can you know stay uh, surrounding that little piece of protein for long enough to get into your cell. So that's really all it is. There may be a couple of other ingredients. You know, I didn't look at the exact um, ingredients, but really it's, it's basically the little piece of protein and then whatever ingredients are necessary to create this, this little coating around. It. So there are probably a couple other things I'm not sure exactly. But, but just sort of like the, the other stuff that kind of like makes it hang in suspension or whatever just the yeah. bits and pieces yeah. yeah um do you know if they're still asking for people to donate blood who've had covid is this still a thing that's going on or was it plasma or was it blood yeah um blood and then they they um you know treat it to uh to isolate the plasma i think 
there's still some studies going on. Mm -hmm. and the idea behind that is the so-called what we call convalescent plasma, plasma in people yeah. with had the disease. Um, in theory, is rich with antibodies against the virus. So um, for people who uh, get sick with COVID, um, in theory, you could give them some of this plasma and it's almost like the monoclonal antibodies that the drug companies have made, but they're natural. Yeah. And, um, you know, in theory, it would uh, help, you know, treat the disease in someone with active disease. The studies have been quite mixed. Um, it probably depends a lot on when you give it. You know, if you give it when someone's really sick, it's probably not going to help that much. Um, you know, even the studies earlier on have been somewhat mixed. It may have to do with the quality of the antibodies in the various, you know, plasma. Some people have better ones. Some people have less and so forth and so on. But it was not um, a home run in terms of, wow, this really works. Um, so they may still be looking for that. I don't think we're still doing the trial here at this site, but that's something you could probably, um, you know, find out. Uh, but the demand isn't quite what it wants. It's not as high as it okay. was, yeah, because it gotcha. hasn't turned out to be quite as promising as, as we hoped. Cool. But you had to try to know. Yeah. He said that they heard the Moderna vaccine was better for Asian populations. Is there any truth to that? Or, and if so, why? Is there any subpopulation data on these specific uh, uh, vaccines? Not that I'm aware of. And, you know, as I mentioned um, in that one slide, there really weren't enough. Yeah. Um, numbers of infections to say anything about the subpopulations that I'm aware of. So and I can't think of any spe specific reason why one vaccine, they're, they're almost identical, okay. the vaccines. Um, you know, there's, there's some slight differences. So I can't see why one would be better than the other. Um, but having said that, they do encourage you to get the same one for your second shot. Yeah, you don't want to switch from the Moderna to the, yeah, right. gotcha. Okay, that makes sense. And you, if you're going to the same site for both, you can pretty much assume that you're getting the same. I mean, they'll know, right? Yeah, they, they'll they'll have on record, um, you know, what you got, but, you know, never hurts to, to write mm -hmm. down yourself. Um, and, you know, logistically, I know one of my colleagues took his elderly mom to get her, um, vaccine done at a, a city site up in the Bronx this weekend and they didn't give her an appointment right away for the second shot he went home and he kept looking and looking on the website and then he was able to make an appointment yeah and I think there are going to be sites that are specifically for second shots and so they're trying to make sure that um you know they have enough both vaccine and sites for everyone who got one to be able to get their second one so you might not necessarily go to the same site for your second shot as you did. Exactly. For the one. Gotcha. You, might, you might go to a different site. That's interesting. That's good to know. Can you take the COVID shot if you have a cold? Yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, if you have a mild cold, I, I think that's fine. I mean, um, you know, the same thing I, I tell folks, you know, with the flu shots, you know, it's really a matter of knowing well, how bad do I feel? And if I have, you know, some additional kind of fever and aches, am I going to really feel crummy? Um, but it shouldn't really interfere with um, with the vaccine. Okay. Um, so I don't think there's any, you know, if it's mild. I mean, you want to make sure you don't have COVID, but. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, if it's just a cold. Somebody asked if you are someone who is on the autism spectrum, if there's any reason why you shouldn't take the shot. Absolutely not. Didn't Definitely so. get it. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely okay. get it. Great. Uh, is there still a shortage of vaccine? Do you know? Is it? I mean, it's it's limited right now to certain populations. Yeah. It's limited right now to certain populations. I don't think you know. I don't think we've given out all the vaccine that we have here in the city. So so in that sense, there may be like for us at the hospital, the state and the city get a certain amount, and then they give us a certain amount. And so we may run out for patients just because we can't get any more. But I think, um, you know, there's enough and, you know, hopefully um, the manufacturers will be able to, to keep up with it.
the limiting factor right now, mm -hmm. honestly, I think is staff to do the vaccine. Gotcha. And, and not the vaccine itself. And slots, you know, and availability. Gotcha.